Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for um, this uh, uh, Tocqueville lecture series sponsored by the Ostrom Workshop and the Tocqueville program. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to a roundtable on the lost history of liberalism from the ancient Rome to the 21st century. This is a roundtable on, uh, on the book with the same title by Professor Helena Rosenblatt, who uh, received her PhD from Columbia University and is a professor of history at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Um, Helena is the author of and editor of many books and articles, especially on French thought including Rousseau and Geneva in 1997, Liberal Values, Benjamin Constant and the Politics of Religion 2008, and most recently, the author of The Lost History of Liberalism, a book that has uh, got a lot of attention in public media and academic um, outlets. Today's um, um, main speaker will be joined by uh, two of our colleagues from IU, uh, Professor Russell Hansen, who is a professor of politics emeritus in political science, and Daniel Cole, who is professor of law and public policy at IU and the Maurer School and the SPIA. Each of uh, uh, the speakers will have, Helena will speak for roughly 30 minutes. Uh, our um, uh, panelists will give responses to the book for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have about half an hour of conversation on the themes of this important book. I'd like to say one personal note about uh, the event today. I think that it's extremely important for us to talk about the, this concept of liberalism at the point in time when the concept itself has uh, uh, become uh, uh, almost uh, uh, a bad word, a word with great connotations, many negative connotations. So it's very important for us to figure out what liberalism is and what we stand to gain from studying liberalism in a historical perspective. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Rosenblatt. I think it's important. That yeah, can, sure. Yeah. I'll just take this. Work, work your way. Okay. Thank you very much, Aurelian, and uh, thank you also to the Tocqueville program and the Ostrom workshop. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you all for, uh, for coming here today. Uh, people have been congratulating me on my prescience, you know. How could I time my book so well so that it would uh, be published right in the middle of what people are calling a uh, crisis, a real crisis of liberal democracy? Populism is on the rise around the world, including in America. Liberals at home are disoriented, anxious, divided, and confused. So how could I have been so prescient to predict this? Well, of course, I wasn't. Um, I didn't predict this at all. I don't think any of us could. Um, I began writing this book years ago when the situation was not quite as gloomy. But that doesn't mean that it isn't relevant, I think, to us today. Um, there is a saying attributed to Mark Twain that you may be familiar with. It's falsely attributed <laughs> to Mark Twain, but nevertheless, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I'll begin by speaking briefly about what led me to write this book and why I adopted a certain approach to this history of liberalism. I'll explain this new approach, in other words, the methodology that has led me to what I think are some rather surprising, if not startling, discoveries. Then I have selected three or four of these discoveries and will tentatively suggest some broad lessons that we might draw from them today. So why I wrote this book. My dissertation and first book uh, was on Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, as you all know, is widely regarded as one of the most important and influential political theorists of all time. He is, of course, rarely seen as a liberal thinker, but um, his influence on them was enormous. My second book was on Benjamin Constant, much less known. He is now increasingly recognized as a founder of liberalism and plays a central role in my book. Over the years that I spent writing these two books and, and published some articles and edited and reviewed books about other liberal thinkers, as part of my work, um, 
I became aware of a curious fact. There didn't exist a book in print on the proper history of liberalism, at least not anything with the span and scope that I thought the topic de deserved. There were books on individual thinkers. There were books on liberal statesmen, books on liberal parties, but no comprehensive history of liberalism. Given liberalism's importance to Western thought, I thought this odd. So I was attracted by the challenge and took it up. Of course, there have been myriad books attacking liberalism and defending liberalism, and that's the case more than ever today. The bookshops are filled with books lamenting the retreat or decline of liberalism, the failure of liberalism, the death of liberalism, and yet there is no history of liberalism that I know of. But when I embarked on the project some years ago, I immediately encountered a set of rather perplexing questions and contradictions. In one way or another, these questions all involved defining liberalism. There were different definitions out there. Why was it, I wondered, for example, why liberalism in colloquial, parliaments, colloquial parlance means one thing in America and something else in most of the world today? In America, big government. The rest of the world, small government. Why do some people speak of a classical liberalism that they seem to think is more authentic than today's? Is there a difference between liberalism and liberal democracy? which are sometimes used interchangeably today. What is the relationship, if any, between libertarianism and liberalism? Libertarianism, libertarians often call themselves the true, in other words, orthodox liberals. And why are there finally so many different founders of liberalism? Some call Machiavelli a founder, while others speak of John Locke or even Jesus Christ. How can all these be founders of liberalism when they are so very different? While pondering these and other questions, I couldn't help noticing that liberalism was often called a slippery, elusive, or vague concept in the books and articles that I read. The most serious scholars discussing liberalism would often confess that it's hard to define it. But then they just go on and stipulate a personal definition and refer to a number of thinkers and concepts to back that definition up in effect cherry-picking principles from past writers that supported their own definitions. As an historian, I found this very problematic. When you adopt such an approach, you are in fact projecting your own views on the past. You are not telling the history of liberalism. You are explaining your own views with a few selective references to the past, and the past as you see it. Picking ideas out of context and lining them up in chronological order to support your own views does not constitute doing history to me. And it results in all these different conflicting or at least confusing definitions of liberalism, a term that is so important to our political discussions. How can we have productive political conversations about liberalism and liberal democracy when we are not in agreement over the terms that we are using? We are speaking past each other. So the question I grappled with was how to write a history of liberalism when we don't really know what it is, or when we disagree about what it is. I wasn't about to just stipulate my own definition and do what others were doing. Clearly, I couldn't do that. So I chose another way. I decided to let those in the past speak for themselves. So in my book, I trace the history of the meaning of the words liberal and liberalism to the people who employed the wor words from ancient Rome until today. I try to answer the following questions, among others. What did liberal mean to the people who used the term 2,000 years ago? And how did that meaning change over time? When was the word liberalism coined? And why was it coined? And what did it, what did it mean to the people who used it? When was the first liberal party formed, and what did it stand for? And this approach led to a number of surprising findings. First discovery. The so-called Anglo-American tradition is an after-the-fact construction and myth. What do I mean by this? 
While we tend to think of liberalism as an age-old and venerable Anglo-American tradition with roots stretching deep into English history, some trace its origins as far back as the Magna Carta and then speak of John Locke. Some speak of Adam Smith after that. From England, liberalism is said to have spread and slowly gained acceptance until it was transported to America in the 18th century. There, its principles were enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution. During the 19th century, liberalism continued its steady and inexorable progress until it became the dominant doctrine of the West. Well, this is a nice story, but it's also a myth. Liberalism as a word and a cluster of ideas emerged in France in the wake of the French Revolution and not before. The word was coined in or around 1810. Among its very first theorists were Benjamin Constant and Madame de Staël, not Machiavelli, not John Locke, and not Jesus Christ. Indeed, for most of the 19th century, liberalism was widely seen as a French doctrine, closely associated with that country's successive revolutions, 1789, 1830, 1848, in 1870 to 71. The first liberal parties that called, them, called themselves this and were recognized as such were in Sweden and in Spain, established by people taking their inspiration from the principles of the French Revolution of 1789. This was way before it became a political term in America. The Encyclopedia Americana of 1831 didn't contain an entry on liberalism. And the article on liberal explained that its political meaning came from France. Only half a century later was liberalism given an entry in the American Cyclopedia of Political Science. And even then, it was a translation of a French article equating liberalism with the principles of 1789, the principles of the first French Revolution. As late as the closing years of the 19th century, liberal remained a rare word in the language of American politics. And when it was used, it was sometimes spelled liberal with an E at the end, or rendered in italics to indicate its foreignness. So one major discovery was the central importance to Fran of France to the history of liberalism. Secondly, as it turns out, when you listen to the people of the time and follow the use of the word, Germany plays a huge role in the history of liberalism as well. Today, many think of Germany as only having an illiberal tradition. German thinkers were instrumental in reconceiving and reformulating liberalism in the mid-19th century in response to changing economic conditions, the effects due mainly to industrialization and urbanization. Early 19th century liberals, that is the first liberals, fought mainly for the rule of law, civic equality, representative and constitutional government with a number of guaranteed rights and safeguards. But as new problems arose over the course of the 19th century, liberals adjusted their goals and focused on and fo focused on and fought for other things as well. Industrialization, they saw, generated great wealth, but also huge income disparities and what came to be seen as endemic poverty in the cities, something people began to call pauperism. Liberal, liberals now became interested in these ideas coming from Germany, where a school of political economists were advocating more government intervention in the economy to help the poor. Their ideas were translated and disseminated in France and Britain and came to America as well, thanks to the thousands of Americans who went to Germany to study at university there in the 19th century. All of this led to what some people began to call new liberalism. And it was this new liberalism that was imported into America in the second decade of the 20th century and thereafter gained currency. It was imported and disseminated by a group of thinkers and politicians who called themselves progressives until they adopted the term liberal, terms liberal and liberalism. The journal The New Republic and those around it played a major role, as did Woodrow Wilson. 
And here comes another interesting fact. The idea of an Anglo-American liberal tradition was invented half a century later. This, and not before, is when John Locke was inducted as a founding father. It's something to wrap one's head around. Locke became a founding father of liberalism in the middle of the 20th century, when, because of the threat of totalitarianism, in other words, fascism, Nazism, communism, America needed a safe ideological ancestor. Someone who was, first of all, from the right country, and who, secondly, stood for individual rights against the totalitarian menace. France and Germany were written out of the history of liberalism because of their role in World War II. Property rights were emphasized like never before because of the Cold War. Richard Rorty, the great American philosopher, said the following. Like the history of anything else, history of philosophy is written by the victors. Victors get to choose their ancestors. Now, what are some of the lessons we can draw from this? I suggest to you, and perhaps it's something to discuss, that the story we have been telling ourselves about the history of liberalism, the false history of a supposedly Anglo-American tradition, encourages us to think of liberal democracy as something inevitable, even foreordained. And this gives us perhaps a false sense of assurance. It's so obvious somehow. We often hear the suggestion that the principles of liberal democracy are on the right side of history. Its peaceful and progressive advance is somehow assumed to be assured because it is so obviously reasonable and right. This is a reassuring thought, but does it make us dangerously complacent? Ed Luce, in a recent op-ed in the Financial Times and at a lecture at the Graduate Center where I teach, made this point. He warned us that this view of the march of history can indeed make us complacent. If liberal democracy is on the right side of history, perhaps we can just stand aside and let history play itself out. Do we need to vote? Do we need to campaign? It can also foster a kind of self-righteousness and smugness all of history seems to point to us. And then because of this arrogance, it then also generates or provokes cynicism about our system of government, which also is dangerous and sad, especially among the young, I think. This history of liberalism as somehow smooth and peaceful and inexorable is a myth. Liberalism was born of revolution and met with fierce resistance from the very beginning. Liberals had to fight to save the principles of 1789, the rule of law, civic equality, constitutional representative government, and a guaranteed number of rights, among which I emphasize freedom of religion and freedom of the press. Liberals faced overwhelming odds against forces of reaction, the combined authority and resources of the throne and altar alliance. Liberalism's progress was never smooth nor certain, but characterized by fits and starts, reversals and regressions. There was nothing inevitable about its success. We lament the incivility of today's political discourse, but believe me, things weren't any better in the 19th century. Evidence suggests that the word liberalism itself was invented as a term of abuse and was used to smear and stigmatize liberals. Isms were generally at first pejorative terms and often referred to heresies. Think of Anabaptism, Calvinism, Lutheranism, and now liberalism, which was also called a religio-political heresy by its enemies. Because liberals advocated religious toleration and church-state separation, they were called atheists. Because they championed free press, they were called anarchists. Because they attacked the privileges of the nobility, they were called selfish. When they advocated the right to divorce and later sex education and birth control, they were called sexual deviants who wanted to destroy the family. Let me give you a few quotations from my book just to give you a flavor of this. So liberalism was called satanic, demonic, and sexually perverse. Liberalism was called an influenza, a moral plague, 
the very principle of Satan. Liberals, their adversaries said, were not just bent on destroying religion, the family, and the community, but they hated God. The strongest criticism came from the Catholic Church and religious orthodoxy. Pope Pius IX called liberalism abominable, monstrous, illegal, impious, absurd, sacrilegious, and outrageous to every law, human and divine, and that was one long quote. In a pamphlet titled simply, Liberalism is a Sin, a Catholic spokesman called liberalism a greater sin than blasphemy, theft, adultery, homicide, or any other violation of the law of God. And you thought Patrick Deneen was harsh. 19th century liberals would have been bemused by our complaints about civility, incivility. They were harassed, they were spied upon, their publications were censored, their meetings prohibited, they were thrown in jail, forced underground or into exile. That's the true history of liberalism. Their problems were not incivility. They thought for ideas and policies. Battles over words are always battles over things, said Madame de Stael who kept her eye on the ball, on what liberals were fighting for. Liberalism was, from the very beginning, a fighting faith. Secondly, the phenomenon of populism, or what some people call illiberalism today, would not have surprised early liberals. By these terms, I mean popular governments, in principle elected democratically, but who put in place authoritarian rulers, despots and demagogues, who govern in a manner that erodes fundamental liberal principles. The rule of law checks and balances individual rights like freedom of the press, and yet they remain popular. This is what we mean when we speak of illiberal democracies. And some are confused by that term, but we mustn't be. A common mistake that many today make is to conflate liberalism with democracy or to think that they are natural allies Sometimes they are used interchangeably today, but the two concepts are not synonyms and should not be confused. 19th century liberals did not confuse them or treat them as synonyms. For most of their history, democracy and liberalism have not even been compatible. From the time of the ancient Greeks, democracy has meant rule by the people. Some have interpreted this to mean direct political participation by all free male citizens. Others have taken it to mean a representative system based on the suffrage of all male citizens. Either way, however, well into the 19th century, the majority of liberals were hostile to the very idea of democracy, which they associated with chaos and mob rule. The French Revolution proved to liberal, liberals like them that the public was utterly unprepared for political rights. People were ignorant, irrational, and prone to violence. Under their pressure, during the radical phase of the revolution, the rule of law had been suspended, enemies of the people guillotined, rights trampled upon. The most democratic phase of the revolution had also been the most bloody. Liberals then watched with frustration as demagogues and dictators manipulated the electorate by appealing to its lowest instincts and gullibility. Napoleon I, Napoleon III, Bismarck in Germany, again and again, these demagogues and, dis and dictators ignored, trampled, and abolished the rights and safeguards that liberals fought so hard for. And yet they remained popular. There was nothing strange to liberals about democracy turning illiberal. Certainly the founders of liberals, liberalism were not Democrats. Benjamin Constant stood for strict property qualifications for both voting and office holding. Madame de Stael favored ruled by the best, which she explicitly differentiated from democracy. Tocqueville warned about the tyranny of the majority. Napoleon's despotism, which was legitimized repeatedly by plebiscites based on universal male suffrage, only confirmed the liberals' apprehensions about democracy. The emperor's popularity demonstrated that French citizens had an unhealthy predilection for authoritarian rulers and were fatally susceptible to propaganda. New words were invented to call his regime. Some called it democratic despotism. Others used the term 
Bonapartism or Caesarism. Constant called it usurpation. Usurpers, he said, are constantly compelled to justify their authority. So they use lies and propaganda to manufacture support. They form alliances with religious authorities to prop up their regimes. They take their countries into useless wars to distract people from their treachery while they enhance their own power, line their own pockets and those of their friends. Worst of all, they corrupt the people by tricking them into participating in their lies. Sound familiar? Let's listen to Benjamin Constant on the Emperor Napoleon, whom he accused not only of betraying the ideals of the revolution, but of misleading, deceiving, and ultimately corrupting the electorate. A demagogue and despot like Bonaparte, Constant wrote, was compelled to distract public attention by bellicose enterprises. He dazzled men's minds by use of spectacle and crisis. This kind of illegitimate rule or usurpation, and I quote, combines and legitimizes every kind of internal and external tyranny. It introduces into judicial forms a hastiness destructive both of their sanctity and of their purpose. It corrupts the rising generations. It divides the people into two parts. Napoleon Constant explained, provided, extorted, or paid for acclamation, which sounded like the national voice. The rule of demagogues depends on manipulation and deceit, and this is also how it corrupts the electorate. In Constant's own voice, their form of rule, quote, condemns man to speak. It pursues him into the most intimate sanctuary of his thoughts, and by forcing him to lie to his own conscience, makes him complicit in his own degradation. Yet another discovery I made while writing this book is how much time liberals spent on morals and education. When we are told about the Anglo-American liberal tradition, we are so often told that individual rights were central, that liberalism is primarily about the safeguarding of individual rights, and property rights often are re regarded as central. But 19th century liberals, the inventors of liberalism, spent at least as much time on civics and how to foster the values essential to good citizenship as they did on rights. Laws without morals are useless, they said. Liberal constitutions without civic values cannot survive. Liberal democracy is impossible without them. Early liberals like Constant Tocqueville spent much time thinking about how to counter the perils of democracy. Limits had to be placed on the sovereignty of the people, the rule and individual rights guaranteed, but good laws would never be enough since a popular strong man could easily pervert or simply ignore them. The survival of liberal democracy required a politically educated citizenry. Constant traveled around France instructing French citizens about the principles of their constitution, their rights and their duties. He published articles and delivered speeches for the same purpose. He fought valiantly for the freedom of the press and wrote copiously about morals. Upon his death, he was given a state funeral that celebrated his services to France. It was said that, quote, no other writer has contributed as much to her political education. No other writer has been better at popularizing constitutional questions and rendering them familiar to all classes of citizens. Madame de Staël's novels, it is fair to say, were delivery mechanisms for values, generosity, toleration, self-sacrifice, the values she thought were essential in a liberal democracy. And this has all been written out of the history of liberalism, in my opinion. Today, we seem quite obsessed with rights. And of course, rights are crucial. But how about obligations? How about regard for the community? Tocqueville thought deeply about fostering public morality and public virtue in the general public. Constant or, or agonized over the political complacency, moral apathy, and selfishness that he saw all around him. Only dictators profited from such vices. John Stuart Mill, today mainly thought of as a champion of individualism, said that it was necessary to give people a liberal education that taught them 
ethics and politics in the largest sense. He wrote about fostering a religion of humanity that would cultivate in individuals a deep feeling for the general good. There is no doubt that early liberals were elitist, but they expected a lot of the elite. The enlightened classes, wrote Constant, and well-meaning men must be missionaries of truth. They must redouble their efforts to counter the cynicism that was turning people away from the public good. As Tocqueville said, it was essential to educate democracy. And this, he said, was the primary duty imposed on the leaders of society today. That this sounds naive or corny today testifies to our cynicism. Liberals, liberals spoke not only of rights, but of duties. As an historian, I tend to think that getting history right is important on its own. But I also think that history can lend critical perspective on the present. It can tell us about the challenges people in the past faced, the options they had, and the choices they made. Historians can at least try to provide their readers with information relevant to the making of judgments about their current values and beliefs. Now today, I have to say that I've left out some of the darker and more disturbing sides of liberalism. They're in my book, and I'm sure, or I think they might come up in discussion. I have been accused of being a defender of liberalism. I confess that, at the pre that I find the present moment so depressing, so distressing, that I feel the need to emphasize the positive. Benjamin Constant spoke of the pleasing illusions we all need to buck up the spirit, and in some way, I guess, I also want to believe that somehow we are still on the right side history. Thank you. The Lost History of Liberalism is a very fine book, and I recommend it to everyone here, and I believe are really, and there are vouchers for those who have not purchased it yet, so that they can get a discount on this. 30% discount. All right, very good. But I'm particularly impressed by Dr. Rosenblatt's success in highlighting the French and German contributions to the history of liberalism, which have been, as she said, overlooked by those who consider liberalism to be an Anglo-American construct. I would interpret the Anglo part of that broadly uh, to be not just British, but I would include other Commonwealth contributions, say Will Kimlicka uh, and liberal multiculturalism or multicultural liberalism, whichever way you would like to say that, or Duncan Iverson's post-colonial liberalism, all in the Anglo part of that. Um, but I'm particularly, in, I think, impressed by the fact that elevating the contributions of liberals in France and Germany to present consideration is important given the emergence of illiberal democracies in Central Europe today and the retreat of Anglo-American liberalism for just the reasons that we've, we've heard. So it seems to me especially important that we get this, this uh, robust corrective to our kind of historical one-sidedness uh, that has been uh, so evident. And so I think that Dr. Rosenblatt's book reminds Americans and British liberals of their heritage, which is not simply a legacy of rights, but also a sense of moral solidarity with others, or should I say, all others, including those not like ourselves. Dr. Rosenblatt is quite right, I think, in saying and insisting that liberalism is, is at root a moral undertaking in which the rights of individuals, all individuals, ought to be respected. And that's not merely a platitude but rather it's bound up in the recognition that our own well-being is bound up in the well-being of others. And that entails a sense of duty and obligation to others as well, and a respect for their rights too. Uh, some might add a religious dimension to this. Uh, I'll say more about that in a bit. And I will say too that uh, Dr. Rosenblatt's book exhibits all of these wonderful liberal qualities. Uh, she is sympathetic when she ought to be. She's critical of liberals when she must be, uh, and skeptical when she should be. So it's a really a delightful book, and it's a very 
even-handed essay. Uh, it's elegantly conceived and beautifully written, and I really do recommend it to you. Having said this, I do have some slight discomfort with the proposition that we ought to distinguish varieties of liberalism in terms of their national expressions. It's certainly a useful corrective uh, and a valuable contribution to bring to our attention the French and German contributions to liberalism. And Dr. Rosenblatt has done a great service in highlighting them, while noting differences among French liberals as well as German liberals. But liberalism as a political philosophy, or even as an ideology, is, and I think in modern times has always been, a dialogue among self-proclaimed liberals of different nationalities. It has had universal aspirations or ambitions uh, that cannot be easily contained, it seems to me, within national categories. At least now, historically, we might have uh, said differently. And I think in particular, a national characterization of liberalism is less useful for the United States, which became a destination for liberals from France, from Germany, from Britain, and from uh, many other European countries uh, during the uh, lat latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. So it's very difficult to say that there is a, a national version of liberalism in the United States. It is an amalgamation of different national versions of liberalism. So what I want to do here is to suggest that there are certain risks uh, entailed by thinking about varieties of liberalism in terms of their national origins or expressions. Uh, I think, for example, that uh, it uh, discourages closer attention to the affinities between liberals of different nationalities. So, in particular, uh, the affinities between John Stuart Mill and Auguste Comte are not played up in this book, and for the reason that uh, they are more about, if you will, the liberal uh, or the economic liberalism, whereas the political liberalism is what is really featured uh, in Dr. Rosenblatt's book. But embedded in those economic issues are such liberal considerations as the dignity of work, considerations of just desert, and hence obligations toward others, and a secular view of politics, which, as Dr. Rosenblatt said, is in fact a defining feature of liberalism. It is a foundational principle, she says. Now, to say that church and state ought to be separated does not mean that religion has no role to play in politics, uh, and that has been also part of the story that Dr. Rosenblatt has said. Her overarching point is the historical extinction of moral considerations in liberalism in the form of duties and obligations toward others uh, or responsibly for them as religion has faded into the background in part. I'll question that later. Here I'm simply uh, noting this fact that sometimes the national categorization of varieties of liberalism gets in the way of looking at the interplay between these national varieties. So let me give an example of that in Thomas Paine. The British-born émigré from the United States, who became one of the chief propagandists of the French Revolution, the birthplace of liberalism, uh, which drew the ire of the Irish-born Edmund Burke, who defended the American Revolution endorsed enthusiastically by Paine in common sense, though Burke decried the French Revolution in his reflections on the French Revolution. Well, here's a multinational kind of conversation that's going on that is not easily slotted into uh, a simple American Anglo or Anglo-American uh, tradition here. In particular, I think uh, the, the way out of that uh, is to point out, as Dr. Rosenblatt did, that uh, Burke was fairly sympathetic to the aristocracy and the attack on the aristocracy in France was not matched by, uh, in his view at any rate, an attack on the aristocracy in the New World. Well, to that, I have to give my, my favorite quote of Paine from Common Sense. To the evil of monarchy, we have added that of hereditary succession, so sweeping up aristocracy as well. And as the first is a degradation and lessening of ourselves, so the second, claimed as a matter of right, is an insult and imposition on posterity. For all men being originally equals, no one by birth could have a right to set up his own family in perpetual preference to all others forever. And though himself might deserve some decent degree of honors of his contemporaries, yet his descendants might be far too unworthy to inherit them. One of the strongest natural proofs of the folly of hereditary kings, said Paine, is that nature disapproves it. Otherwise, she would not so frequently turn it into ridicule by giving mankind an ass for a lion. <laughs> so there may have been respect 
uh, uh, um, for aristocratic traditions in some of the southern colonies where you found the second and third and fourth sons of uh, English property owners uh, settling because they were denied rights to uh, English, uh, Welsh, and Scottish lands under laws of primogeniture. But the traditional forms of aristocracy were unpopular if unknown, if not unknown, in northern colonies populated by religious refugees in many cases, Puritans, Quakers, and other religious uh, sects. Their merit, whether religious, social, or economic, reigned in societies that recognized other social distinctions. But what puzzles me most is the claim that liberalism was unknown in the USA, or at least not named politically, until about 1916 or 1917. Uh, Dr. Rosenblatt cites Herbert Crowley, founder of the New Republic, as endorsing government regulation of the economy, since Crowley adopted the term, this is now her language, to show solidarity with the liberal government and liberal thinkers in Great Britain with whom he sympathized. I want to disagree with that uh, historical claim. It's not right to say that liberalism was unknown in the US until Crowley. In 2002, Nancy Cohn published a very good book entitled The Reconstruction of American Liberalism, 1865 to 1914, which suggests that Crowley represented the end of a process of rethinking liberalism, not the beginning of a new characterization of liberalism. Uh, and I think in some ways uh, that's recognized in Dr. Rosenblatt's discussion of Lincoln who was regarded by European liberals as one of their fellow travelers uh, based on his opposition to slavery, although they may not have understood that Lincoln's opposition to slavery did not mean he believed in racial equality, as Frederick Douglass understood so well. So it's not just Cohen's work, though, that stands in opposition to Dr. Rosenblatt's claim about the timing of liberalism's entry into the political vocabulary. Uh, here, let me share some of my own research on this that begins with the recognition that there's a difference between achieving the separation of church and state at the federal level in the USA, which was accomplished by the implementation of the Constitution of 1789, and the separation of church and state at the state and local level, which took more than 100 years to come even partially close to that kind of separation of church and state. And remember, separation of church and state is a foundational uh, and cardinal principle of liberalism. So, for instance, it was not until 1877 that New Hampshire, uh, abutting the Roman Catholic province of Quebec, uh, finally removed its constitutional requirement that state office holders be Protestant. Church properties are still exempt from state and local taxation in most states and municipalities. The federal government supports chaplains in federal prisons and the armed forces, public displays of religious icons, including the Ten Commandments, not to mention nativity displays. There's a recent Indiana case on this uh, as well. Um, still occur while pagan displays are banned despite Supreme Court rulings that go unenforced for local political reasons. All of this is by way of emphasizing what Dr. Rosenblatt herself insists upon, which is the intimate connection between liberalism and socialism. But once we connect liberalism to secularism, efforts to attribute liberalism to nationalities begin to come under some question, because secularism itself is not nationally specific. So uh, let me uh, say much more about this uh, in the latter half of the 19th and early 20th centuries when the USA received thousands, indeed millions, of immigrants from Britain, France, Germany, and many other European countries. What I'm about to say then really reflects the comments that she's made about the USA. I'm not competent to talk about uh, her characterization of events uh, in Europe, although I would be interested in uh, Protestants' reaction in France and Catholics' reaction in Germany to the emergence of liberalism, particularly to the extent that it was not, in fact, as um, uh, tolerant as it might have been. But I do think that this is also a way of understanding why liberalism emerged in the United States in the latter half of the 19th century. It's in part a reflection of the streams of immigration that are coming to the, uh, to the USA. It's unpopular people bringing their unpopular ideas with them and finding a place where they can actually live according to those ideals, often separate from the people who they used to live next to in France or Germany because they had religious differences. So let me say a little bit more about that. 
The diversity of the American political culture reflects this flow of immigration from largely from British sources initially, but ultimately uh, larger European sources. So there were in the US by the mid 19th century, uh, self-described USA liberals, uh, mostly informed by French political thinkers, not necessarily liberal French political thinkers, but if you, uh, Bill Scheuermann is here, he can comment on the, uh, the appearance in the late uh, 1840s of Fourierist phalanxes in northern uh, New York, organized around the principles of Fourier, deemed in France a socialist, as indeed he surely was. But his ideas did not necessarily come across that way in the United States. These phalanxes were joint stock companies. So all of a sudden they begin to look a little more liberal than they might have looked in France. But they were organized in strict mathematical congruence with Fourier's formula um, and received the support of even people like Horace Greeley, founder and editor of the New York Tribune, who was a devotee and used his newspaper to advance the cause of American joint stock socialism, which, as I'm suggesting, looks a lot like uh, secular liberalism in the American in instantiation. Most of those phalanxes were short-lived. Mathematically harmonized divisions of labor and forms of social interaction, I'm being delicate now, uh, were incorrigibly agonistic or liberal, as Fourier might have said. But the French influence returned after the Civil War in the form of, again, communes, but this time organized around Comte's positivi uh, positivism and the religion of humanity. So there is a, a very thriving community on Long Island organized by one of the uh, best known reformers of the time, Stephen Pearl Andrews, who among other things brought the Gregg system of shorthand to uh, court stenography and newspaper reporting. But Comte su supplied the humanist rationale for modern times, the name of this community, but its economics were supplied by Josiah Warren, a laissez-faire economist par excellence. In short, this was an experiment in capitalism with a human face, a morally grounded economy of free labor. Today, Warren is mostly remembered as an anarchist, but that really does overlook his attention to the non-economic dimensions of human association, let alone the overlay of Comte's religion of humanity. This is indeed liberalism with a conscience of the sort that I think Dr. Rosenblatt wants us to remember and perhaps even emulate. Post-Civil War emigres from Germany to the USA also emphasized the social dimensions of liberalism while rejecting political orthodoxy and insisting on separation of church and state to the point where German Catholic emigres would settle in different parts of the country than German Lutheran emigres so that they didn't have to uh, contest with each other. But wherever they settled, the Germans brought a collective sense of identity expressed in the formation of specifically German churches the publication of German language newspapers, the formation of gym gymnastic clubs, and indeed the Turnverein were often the hosts of cultural and political events where such things as moral education would be discussed. The German influence was uh, exerted through the heavy migration of German freight anchors to Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Denver, Los Angeles, and San Francisco after the Civil War. And these migration streams then in the USA at least muddle the story about national origins of uh, liberalism, and also the date of the American uh, introduction of the term to the political vocabulary. So I would put the date of the introduction of liberalism in the American political vocabulary as the centennial celebration of independence, July 4th, 1876, with the formation of, in Philadelphia, no less, the National Liberal League, complete with a platform of the nine demands of liberalism. And it is a very secular document that is respected there. So let me just give you a sense of the flavor of these nine demands of liberalism. We demand that churches and other ecclesiastical property shall no longer be exempt from taxation. We demand that the employment of chaplains in Congress and in the legislatures, in the Navy, in militia, in prisons, asylums, and all other institutions supported by the public money shall be discontinued. We demand that all public appropriations for educational and charitable institutions of a sectarian character shall cease. We demand that all religious services now sustained by the government shall be abolished, and especially that the use of the Bible in the public schools 
whether ostensibly as a textbook or avowedly as a book of religious worship, shall be prohibited. We demand that the appointment by the President of the United States or by governors of the various states of all the religious festivals and fasts shall wholly cease. We demand that the judicial oath in the courts and in all other departments of the government shall be abolished and that a simple affirmation under pains and penalties of perjury shall be established in its stead. No need to swear on a Bible. We demand that all laws directly or indirectly enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath shall be repealed. We demand that all laws looking to the enforcement of Christian morality shall be abrogated and that all laws shall be conformed to the requirements of natural morality, equal rights, and impartial liberty. We demand that not only in the Constitution of the United States and of the several states, but also in the practical administration of the same, no privileges or advantage shall be conceded to Christianity or any other special religion. That our entire political system shall be founded and administered on a purely secular basis. Whatever changes shall prove necessary to this end shall be consistently, unflinchingly, and promptly made. So the nine demands of liberalism are meant to neutralize the role of churches in American politics. But they did so in the name of rights. These are rights against federal policies, state laws, and municipal ordinances that were restricting the religious freedom of people who were not members of the locally predominant majority uh, sect. So it's there in the language before Crowley. I don't want to say that the National Liberal League was an immense political organization and a terrifically successful one. Its membership was never deep, but it was wide. Judging from subscriptions to the following journals, which were well known at the time, the Boston Investigator, the New York Truth Seeker, San Francisco's Free Thought, Chicago's Free Thinker Magazine, and Liberal Review. These journals and a well-organized circuit of national and regional lecturers proclaimed the doctrine of secularism throughout the land, advocating reforms of the sort that are mentioned in the nine demands, but also birth control, reform of divorce laws, and a whole set of other restrictions on, that played out unevenly across gender lines. So I think the point here is that the challenges were framed in terms of rights, but against prohibitions embedded in municipal ordinances and state laws. And those who violated these ordinances and laws were fined, imprisoned, and not infrequently run out of town, sometimes uh, after being tarred and feathered. So the point is that uh, I think the notion that liberals in the 20th century retreated into rights uh, is certainly correct at one level, but it may be true especially among philosophers. I think it's less true on the ground, politically speaking, where the rights were always invoked against laws and ordinances that were, in fact, uh, contrary to the core notion of a secular polity. So this is the underbelly, if you will, of the fight for liberalism, certainly in the USA and perhaps elsewhere. And I think we need to keep those politics in sight uh, as, as we go. And in fact, the American Civil Liberties Union was a direct outgrowth of the efforts of the National Liberal League to provide a defense fund for people who ran afoul of uh, state laws or municipal ordinances. Ultimately, the National Liberal League chartered more than 300 local chapters uh, spread across the continent. They eventually followed the, the British model and declared themselves advocates of secularism, renaming the organization to be the American Secular Union and then somewhat later, the American Secular Union and Free Thought Federation, a nod in the direction of the Freidenkers. But the program of nine demands of liberalism remained intact throughout all of the name changes of the organization. And it was in fact fully encoded in the 1933 Humanist Manifesto, endorsed by John Dewey and defended by him in a common faith. The organization was revived after World War II, once again as the National Liberal League, and it joined with the ACLU in challenging the use of, the use of public monies to support uh, parochial schools. The National Liberal League was a motley crew. Uh, it included atheists, it included agnostics. None of them eschewed morality. The organization regularly uh, sponsored contests for people who would submit uh, manuscripts for secular morality and they would award a prize for the best manuscript. Uh, so again, in the, in the vein of 
teaching people how to be good liberals. Uh, even the free lovers who advocated no-fault divorce insisted that the laws should not bind those who were in a consensual relation. But the bulk of the National Liberal League's membership consisted of religiously inclined people who were a minority in their locale and who suffered under onerous regulations. So, Sabbatarian laws, closing laws on Sunday are cut against Jews, as well as Seventh-day Adventists. And so you find in the National Liberal League a number of very prominent Jewish rabbis, leaders of uh, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, all uh, laboring side by side with the atheists and agnostics in common cause for the preservation of these rights against what they took to be unjust and unfair laws. It uh, also extends into the schoolroom uh, where Protestants were uh, the uh, dominant force. Uh, it would be the King James Bible that was taught in the schools. Where the Catholics were the dominant force, it would be the Dewey Rhymes uh, Bible that would be in force. And so there were these challenges against not just the Bible in, in, in school, but which Bible in school that were being fought out. Common in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, wherever there was a minority view. And so I think, to me, this, this suggests that when Crowley invokes the term liberal, he's invoking a term that was already available and doing so in a way that meant that the, pro, the new republic was not merely an attack on moneyed trusts, but it was a cultural reform program aimed in part at churches that very often supported the economic system that was leaving so many uh, in, in pauper. So I would think uh, that um, it, at least in the US, this is where the, 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 the project of identifying varieties of liberalism in national terms begins to, to break down. And maybe that's simply because it's uh, a, quote, melting pot, or at least was until the immigration controls kick in and uh, we try to uh, evict certainly non-liberals and surely illiberals uh, at every uh, moment in time. But on the ground, the pluralism of religious life and its coexistence with atheism and agnosticism is what led the liberal Unitarians to propose the Humanist Manifesto of 1933, uh, which is uh, clearly a moral statement of the obligations of people toward each other and a commitment to the common good, but on a non-sectarian basis, on a secular human basis, uh, based on some scientific understanding of what human nature is capable of, both good and bad. I won't read the manifesto, it's fun, but uh, in place of the old attitudes involved in worship and prayer, the humanist finds his religious emotions expressed in a heightened sense of personal life and a cooperative effort to promote social well-being. So I think at least in this particular strand of liberalism in the USA, you still have that moral core. This is at a different level than in the kind of philosophical discourse that is going on where liberals do retreat very often into the language of rights without paying much attention to the language of duty. But this is a question about what, what level you're telling the story at as much as anything, and there, the story may not be the same at different levels uh, of the telling. So in her epilogue, Dr. Rosenblatt recounts the twists and turns of intellectuals' debates over liberalism, particularly in the post-World War II period, uh, concentrating on uh, American and British thinkers. And I have no quarrel with, with her account of that, but I think that may be as much a criticism of intellectuals as it is of anything. Um, because, as I say, on the ground, the politics look a little different. The retreat to rights here is a natural kind of response to what are regarded as unjust, unfair, illiberal laws. And so in that sense, it is an account uh, at that level of upholding liberalism. So by way of conclusion, let me say once again that I think this is a, a wonderful book. I enjoyed reading it a great deal, uh, and I learned a lot from it. Uh, but Dr. Rosenblatt's interest in crediting France and Germany for the development of liberalism overlooks developments elsewhere, I think. And I think that leads to some issues about whether the best strategy of trying to revive liberalism in the morally robust form is to remember our history or is it to look at our politics today? Which is the more, um, which is likely to produce the greater energy, the greater effect, the greater revival of liberalism? Will it be out of a current controversy or out of contemplating our past 
which is the past and not the present. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. So Aurelian, I, I have a lot of interesting things to say, actually a bullet list, but it's one o'clock. I don't know if you, maybe you want to just go to discussion at this point. You want me to go? Okay. Um, well, I, I'll start by saying I'm, I'm proud to say I paid full price for <laughs> Professor Rosenblatt's uh, excellent <laughs> book. It does uh, provide what I think is an invaluable context for ongoing debates about the meaning or plural meanings of liberalism. Uh, and these de debates are too often ahistorical. Uh, I especially appreciate the book's important correction of some current conceptions of classical liberalism that very nearly equate that phrase with libertarianism or what uh, Merkior called liberism. Uh, Professor Rosenblatt's history also confirms uh, Lord Acton's theory of the corrupting influence of power. Uh, whether liberal or radical, once groups take power, they tend to become conservative in trying to keep hold of the power they have. Uh, that's why Karl Popper, who I take to be the central liberal thinker of the 20th century, as Mill was of the 19th, believed that the most important institution of a liberal polity is not popular sovereignty to elect leaders, uh, but popular sovereignty to remove them uh, peaceably. Among the many, uh, many things we learn from uh, or are reminded of by Professor Rosenblatt's uh, book is that political or social liberal, liberalism uh, as much, perhaps more than other political theories or sets of theories, evolves uh, over time. Uh, it's certainly true uh, that the first liberals were not what we would take today to be Democrats uh, with a small d. Uh, but in my view, some form of political equality was always implicit in liberal theory. At some point, uh, it becomes impossible to justify liberalism for me, but paternalism for you. Uh, if political <laughs> equality and the rule of law are considered core tenets of modern liberalism, as I believe them to be, then some form of democratic republicanism or the uh, German uh, Reichstag, uh, for example, uh, was always there, always uh, somehow necessary. Uh, I certainly agree with Professor Rosenblatt that liberalism and democracy are not synonyms, uh, but they've only really been at odds when narrowly defined. Uh, so uh, otherwise, I, I think they they tend to uh, go together. One question that arises in my mind uh, from the book is whether what Professor Rosenblatt describes as the original notion of liberality as a personal trait originating with Cicero, but uh, perhaps uh, older, if not using the same terms, has ever really gone away. I sense it's still there. Uh, in much uh, mainstream, mainstream uh, liberalism, especially uh, in its commitments to epistemic humility uh, and the necessity of toleration as primary virtues. As to whether the notion truly originates with Cicero, uh, I'm inclined to believe that we justifiably could refer to Solon and Cleisthenes as liberal reformers in Athens. Uh, the former brought eunomia, uh, the idea of good governance before Cleisthenes instituted isonomia, equal treatment under law, which was the predicate for Greek democratia. Uh, it would seem odd to say that they could not have been liberal uh, simply because that word did not then exist or was not used in a political sense. Uh, by the same token, it would seem odd to argue that the judges who condemned Socrates to exile or death were not conservatives because that word uh, did not then exist. Uh, one implication of what I've just said, uh, and reflecting my own views, is that liberalism is not so much about the words we use as it is about the 
how we position ourselves around social and political issues. Uh, indeed, we often define what is conservative or liberal relative to the political and social positions individuals take. Uh, and that really has been true since those terms became common currency in the early 19th century. Uh, we, we say typically, well, liberals support same-sex marriage, conservatives oppose it. Liberals opposed slavery, conservatives supported the peculiar institution. Liberals supported social security, conservatives opposed it. Of course, neither liberals or conservatives are always consistent uh, in the positions they take, and liberals are not always on the right side of history. Uh, the Marquis de, de Condorcet uh, made the mistake of supporting the revolution before he became one of its victims, uh, ironically, in part, because of his liberal views. Uh, and speaking of Condorcet, I wonder why he doesn't appear with Benjamin Constant and Madame de Stahl as a central figure uh, in Professor Rosenblatt's book. Is it just because he didn't use uh, the word? A century or more later, uh, liberals who supported eugenics or sought to impose their civilization on savages in other countries arguably were illiberal for failing to reflect on their own fallibility and acting without due humility. Uh, the positions liberals take on specific issues uh, generally reflect their personal dispositions uh, based on socially influenced belief systems uh, that include some understanding of human fallibility, including the suppositions of liberal theory itself, in societies with equally fallible markets and governance institutions. Importantly, a liberal disposition may entail certain social and political positions, but it does not have a teleology. Finally, I wonder whether Professor Rosenblatt's book uh, focuses somewhat too much on France, uh, as Russ did, as ground zero uh, for modern liberalism. Too little, uh, perhaps, on the Scottish Enlightenment, where Hume arguably combined Cicero's uh, liberal personal spirit with Burke's form of political conservative liberalism. Even farther down in liberalism's roots, we find Spinoza's uh, efforts to carve out a sacred space for the individual within, not outside of, society. Uh, more generally, some of the ties, including historical ties, uh, that bind liberalism uh, with the Enlightenment seem to be missing, regardless of what terms are used to describe those ties. Thank you. What I propose to do is to uh, give the uh, floor to the uh, audience to ask a few more, make a few more points, a few more questions, and then uh, I'll give uh, a chance to Professor Rosenblatt to summarize some of her reactions to this. So if you like to identify, say, yeah, you can come here. Sure. So, um, Zach. Liberalism to progressivism, and then is in opposition to 
yeah, these, these are great presentations, so thanks a lot. Learned a lot. W wonderful lecture and wonderful responses. So just, just a question about your, your method, Professor Rosenblatt. So you, you're doing, obviously, history of political thought, and then you're also in making normative interventions, right? So how those things fit together. And so there's one place, and Russ was speaking about this, responding more as an historian who's working to, looking at political movements, but you seem to think that we can go and retell this history and then push back against a rights-based, a rights-focused liberalism. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of normative, complicated normative, philosophical, theoretical reasons why liberalism has moved away from those older positions, um, which one would have to address. I'm, you know, you, you know this, obviously. But I'm just curious, why, you know, that seemed like a very quick, almost sly move, right? Listening to you and also thinking about the book, which I read a while ago. So, I mean, so how, how do those things fit together, the historical, story, these normative interventions, um, you, know, you know, it's a loaded question. Do, don't we have to, of course, engage with these theoretical philosophical arguments that liberals have been making for many decades now about the primacy of rights the, you know, versus, let's say, obligations and duties and so on? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, do I need to put this on? Um, thank you. Thank you so much for those comments and questions. Um, so I'll try because, you know, uh, it's, I'll see what I can do. I'll do my best. Um, book history. I did this book history um, as a, an exercise basically in clarification and also provocation. I want to provoke people to think about the anachronism that's out there that we use, that we're, that's so easily used and is all over the place. So I am deliberately provoking a discussion and a rethinking. Um, uh, and I believe I did follow the word and I only, and you can do these word searches now, which are wonderful. You know, you can look through newspapers, you can look through um, all sorts of publications and look for the word. And I used that to keep me honest, in a sense, to keep me focused the whole time on who's a liberal, what, who is calling who a liberal, and what does it mean to them. I tried very hard, and it was hard for me not to suddenly start looking for concepts. Oh, surely it must be here for the church-state separation. Oh, sure, why, you know, looking for it. And I said, no, 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 no. Look at what they are actually saying. What does it mean? And then how does it evolve over time? Um, so, so I would like to go back to Professor Hansen's uh, discussion about the National Liberal League, which I spent some time on in my book. Um, you clearly, you know, have studied it as well, but I talk at length about the National Liberal League and their nine demands of liberalism. Um, they do use the word, but they don't use it the way Crowley does. They just don't. And the way they are seen and the way they are described, they are for church-state separation, most of all, uh, first of all, right, because they don't think the, amend the amendment, um, clar clar they want a proper amendment to clarify uh, the, that, that there's church-state separation in America, but they also have these uh, groups for free love, for sex education, um, and they are known, and they, one of their leaders is a self-proclaimed atheist and makes, makes fun of Jesus Christ. And they on purpose uh, mail things across borders to start, uh, to start legal processes against the obscenity laws, the Comstock laws, right? But to me, that's not what liberalism means to Crowley. Uh, it's, we are talking about the, the religious, um, the, in the, we're in the religious realm. We're talking about, um, and maybe free love and all of this, which was also considered an obscenity and, an, and kind of a, an attack on religion. They're all wrapped up together in my mind, religion, um, and, and sex because of the role of women and so on, and corruption in general. So it's not a political, in the sense of what, what Crowley means, who's very much on the wavelength of, of Gladstone, I think. Now, as you know, I also talk a lot about the word liberal before the invention of liberalism in France. I say, in fact, that the first liberal party 
was uh, in, in America. It was in Boston. But it was not about politics. It was not about constitutions and representative government and individual rights. It was about religion. It was full of, it was a, a group of gentlemen who considered them, who were eventually called Unitarians. They didn't want to call themselves that first because it was illegal, but eventually they agreed to it. Um, so the Liberal Party then stood for something different from the Liberal Party, um, you know, uh, much, much later. Oh, and on the national origins. Now, I beg to differ with you. Liberalism then, as a word, was coined in France. All right? Now, now it, I mean, I, I, it came there uh, for reasons I describe in the book, and that's what I'm doing. It's a book history with a conceptual history um, on, you know, constructed on top of it. Now, I also thought, I did think that my book talks about uh, uh, exchanges and transmissions of, and conversations between liberals from different regions. I talk about how um, Burke and Constant were in conversation, how Americans went to Germany to learn about the new liberalism, how it, books were translated, and how, you know, John, uh, John Stuart Mill certainly spoke about uh, Auguste Comte and so on and so forth. I'm jumping around. I hope I'm, you're still following me because there was so much, there was so much richness in these comments. I want to do justice to them all. So I'm speaking quickly and, um, but I thought I did do that. If I didn't make that clear, then, then I'm sorry. I completely agree with you. This is uh, an exchange. They are constantly reading each other and talking to each other. Um, what else? Oh, you know, when I, when we said that, we mustn't impose why I had to follow the word, why I wanted to do this to keep my, myself honest, sorry, um, is also, you know, this notion that it always means church-state separation isn't actually true. The Liberal Party in Spain, I did not believe in religious toleration, it was Sp Spanish, uh, Catholicism. How about the liberals in Protestant Germany who supported the Kulturkampf, uh, closing of Catholic churches? Uh, so it's, it's simply not true that liberalism has always meant that or toleration. Have I answered at least some of your questions? Um, yeah. So we have Jeff. Steve, ask the question, and then Jeff will take it. Okay, that's okay. I, um, I, I confess I haven't yet read the book either, but since the subtitle does refer to the 21st century and picking up on uh, Russ's closing comments and since uh, some names have already been mentioned, I'm just curious who today in politics, culture, academia, do you see as the inheritors of this tradition? Uh, 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 are you prepared to name some names and say these are people who are thinking through issues and, 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 and putting forth ideas that are in some ways consistent with this heritage. I, I Thank feel, you. oh. Okay. Um, I'm very uncomfortable as a historian to sort of speak about contemporary uh, politics and I'm sure you here in the political science and department are much, much better at that um, than I am. Uh, what I do think is interesting is the uh, worry about uh, the divisions uh, within, uh, among liberals, uh, and how now there are so many, seem to be so many varieties, and there is a lot of concern about this. Some people have been shying away from the word liberal since the dreaded Reagan spoke about the dreaded L word and they prefer the word progressive. Now it seems that the word liberal is coming back. Now you have Alexandria Cortez, Ocasio-Cortez being a democratic socialist. Can you be a liberal and a socialist at the same time? Can you, these questions are coming back and uh, if they learn, if liberals will learn from history, they'll learn that, you know, first of all, this, these sorts of debates have always existed among liberals. There's never just been one way of being liberal. Um, that there have been liberal uh, centrists and liberal uh, socialists who call themselves that, liberal socialists. I mean, Winston Churchill said, let's not worry about the term, let's not worry if we get called socialist. We're for that. They didn't mean revolution. The, 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 you know, we also have to look at the meaning of the word socialist because for many it simply meant consideration for the poor. 
doing stuff for the poor. It didn't mean revolution or expropriation of property or any such thing. It meant, it meant that. So one thing is for sure that history also sure shows that when um, they were strongest, that liberals were strongest when they came together, and when they found an uplifting message, okay? So here is you were asking who is the liberal today and so on, and, and, and I got a question over here about something about what to do today or the normative, something normative. I just, my sense is that there, you know, that, that there's a need for, um, uh, there's a need for inspiring leadership. There's a, there's a need to speak about something else than policies, kind of obvious, uh, than policies and, and laws, that people are hungry for uh, big ideas uh, expressed in a morally uplifting way, uh, and that liberals shouldn't be afraid of speaking about patriotism, uh, devotion to the common good. Why is everything always about rights and choices? Yeah, we're for rights and choices, but how about obligations? How about citizenship? Um, and so I think, personally, I think that would work better. Uh, there, you know, I, and I think um, that history shows that that does work better. Lincoln was admired, and who mentioned Lincoln too? Yeah, Lincoln, but when people call Lincoln liberal, that's incredibly interesting. The, the guy, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Habeas corpus was suspended. There were prison camps. Um, he increased the size of the government. This is during the, the time of apparently classical liberalism when laissez-faire was supposed to be reigning. And he was called liberal. Why? Because he was morally uplifting leader who, 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 who um, freed the slaves. It still had that core meaning of some kind of nobility, of some kind of some, per, some educational value, a leader who, who, who educated democracy who made democracy safe by uplifting the masses, not catering to their lowest instincts, but to speaking to their better angels. You're all thinking I'm terribly naive, no? no? Hopeful, hopeful. Thank you, Professor Rosenblatt. Uh, I think I, my question uh, first is twofold and also related to what maybe other, other have asked and uh, what I, you have said. Um, you wrote the book, I think a distinct uh, approach is that you focused on the idea of liberal rather than focusing on the concept of liberty. So I think these two things are, are somehow different because uh, if you uh, examine the history of liberalism by the concept of liberty, maybe that will lead you to a more right-focused right right uh, discourse. But when you uh, look at the idea of being liberal, then uh, that's, I think that leads you to, the, to, 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 to finding that uh, there was a, a deep moral uh, concern in the development of liberalism. And uh, like my question is that, um, which do you think uh, defines uh, liberalism more essentially, like the idea of liberty or being lib liberal? And uh, a, a more uh, specific question related to that is that uh, I think there is a uh, interesting uh, history uh, about the uh, struggles between ch uh, church and religion and uh, the liberal parties in, 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 in this uh, uh, process. Um, I think at the same time, uh, uh, the, there is the liberalization of politics, but I, on the other hand, there is also a process of uh, liberalization of church and religion. So uh, do you think, uh, that 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 the the liberalization of religion and the church uh, still should be a um, uh, constant uh, enterprise even in today, right? If if yeah. for example, if we we fo focus on the rights, we may get to the point that we treat all kinds of values equally, and we 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 want to be neutral to all, all kinds of religious and cultural values. But if we want to uh, argue for some liberal values, then we may say that certain religious uh, values are not acceptable uh, in liberal politics. Wow. Um, do I still have this on? Yes, so um, thanks for those very rich uh, and challenging questions. Um, the word, as I explained in my first chapter, 
liberal comes from the Roman, the Latin, liber, and also liberalitas, right? So liber means freedom, but when we're talking about liberalitas, we're also talking about generosity. Uh, so this translated into the English word liberality, which existed for hundreds of years before liberalism was born. Somebody mentioned the Scottish Enlightenment, and of course the Scottish Enlightenment was important to these thinkers, but when they used the word liberal, they meant to open, enlightened, tolerant, generous societies. I don't think they meant a certain kind of constitution or representative government, um, not even Hume, um, uh, and certainly not Smith. Uh, so, so back to your question, uh, I think that, I don't know if you know Quentin, Quentin Skinner's work. Uh, Quentin Squ Skinner has a very interesting argument also about how liberty changed, because you're saying that perhaps if I had looked more at the liberty aspect of liberalism, I might have come up with a more rights-based um, concept at the end. And uh, he would question that too, that something happened to the notion of liberty uh, after Hobbes. He's got that book, Liberty Before Liberalism. Finally, you're, you're, I hope I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. Um, finally, about religious toleration, uh, liberals have from the very beginning grappled with this idea of do we tolerate the intolerant? Um, and, and also what is religion? So uh, those two questions I think go to what you're saying right there. Do we tolerate every kind of religion and how do we define religion? And that's a discussion to have among citizens. What does it mean to be a citizen in this country? Is it just about the, the right to practice your religion? Does it mean something else? Uh, it's it's um, it's complicated. As historians like to say, sorry, it's complicated. We have time for one more question. This yeah. is just real brief. Um, but in 19th century Europe, when they were actually advocating for this liberalism, a lot of these countries also had colonies in Africa, the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, and I know you speak about it in your index. I haven't read your book. So I was wondering, were these, were these proponents of liberalism, were they ignoring the atrocities happening south of the equator, or were they against it? And if you could just comment on that real quick. Yeah, point. absolutely. This is one of the darker sides um, uh, of liberalism that I didn't talk about in, in, in my introductory remarks. But yes, this is, uh, many liberals supported colonies. And uh, here's another interesting fact, though, uh, because many liberals simultaneously uh, attacked uh, and opposed imperialism. So they use these different words. Imperialism uh, referred to a brutal conquest of another country, uh, the military imposition of force, and often by leaders who want to distract the population from uh, problems at home. But you could still be for colonies. <laughs> you could be liberal for colonies, but you're just not supposed to you know, beat people over the head and be brutal about it. That, Unfortunately, they were quite hypocritical about this as well. Uh, as we know, Tocqueville uh, said some absolutely atrocious things about Algeria. Uh, John Stuart Mill spoke about, um, that said that despotism is okay um, among, when, you were, when you're among barbarians. And they did have this idea of a mission, of a civilizing mission, of the idea that the Anglo-Saxon race was better at self-government and therefore had an obligation uh, to teach others. And this was frequently racist because even though they said that they would, uh, they would uh, teach, that their good, genuine colonialism was about uh, teaching self-government and that these colonies eventually would govern themselves, they would slip in remarks about the fact that the white colonies, those settled by white people, would get likely self, be able to govern themselves faster and first. And maybe there were areas, for example, of Africa where it would never be possible. So yes, um, racism, um, but complicated again, because at the and, and there were, al were always those who stood up, you know, in parliament and, and, uh, and said, this is hypocrisy. Uh, we liberals should not be for this. We are not about, and when we're committing atrocities, at the very Tocqueville had people, you know, in Parliament saying, 
this is not civilizing, we're brutalizing. And the other thing I should say is it's not a distinguishing factor of liberalism to be for colonies or for what they call genuine colonialism. It's not distinctive to liberalism. It was common across the political spectrum, as was this horrible uh, race science and, and eugenics. Uh, so, so it's right to point this out, of course, that liberalism had this dark side and uh, many were very hypocritical. Uh, but on the other hand, not, it was not only they, unfortunately. It was a very common Thank thing. Uh, I would say in conclusion that uh, our conversation only proves that liberalism is an open-ending concept because we cannot decide on what liberalism is. But I think liberals, true liberals, I should add, uh, claim the right to uh, not settle issues, to, be, to recognize <laughs> yeah. their fallibility, as Professor Cole pointed out. Uh, not to know where their heart is sometimes, um, sometimes with rights, sometimes with duties. Uh, basically not to close the discussion. And I think it is in this spirit that the Tocqueville program uh, and uh, today's roundtable, I think, should be understood. It's an invitation to a conversation on a topic that is timely, as you pointed out so eloquently, and it's so urgently for us. Whether liberal, liberals should incline a little bit to the left or to the right is a conversation that we should have because there's nothing dogmatic about a topic like liberty, our duties, and our rights. Whoever wants to close the discussion is more or less a dogmatic person. And I think it, it is in this spirit that I'd like to invite you to read Professor Rosenblatt's wonderful book. Read other books as well, because she has not said the last word on this topic. She had only contributed a wonderful uh, book to a, a very important conversation. I'd like to thank our panelists, Russ uh, Hansen and Dan Cole. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.